since I didn't want to get a new like career in America. When I came back, I was just like doing odd jobs. I would work wine tastings. I would do gig stuff. Oh, you need somebody to work as a vendor at a baseball game? Okay. You need a barista at Starbucks for two weeks for a conference? Okay. Those are things that I was doing, just little light stuff. So nothing tying me down. One thing I knew for sure was I was coming back to Paris. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Flourish in the Foreign, the podcast that elevates and affirms the voices and the stories of Black women living and thriving abroad. I'm your host, Christine Job, a Black American woman living and still trying to thrive here in Barcelona in the midst of this global pandemic. And I'm so thrilled that you are back. And if this is your first time here, welcome. As most of you know, Flourish in the Foreign is hosted, edited, created, produced, all of the things by me. Yes, me. And although this is a labor of love, it is labor nonetheless. I'd appreciate you supporting the podcast in whichever way you can. One way to support the podcast is by becoming a subscriber to the podcast Patreon page. You can go to www.patreon.com slash flourish foreign to become a Patreon of this podcast. And on that note, shout out to our latest Patreon supporter, Joan. Thank you so much, Joan. Thank you so much for becoming a supporter of this podcast. It is so, so important and I deeply appreciate it. And as you guys know, once you become a Patreon supporter, I will shout you out here on this podcast. As I mentioned a couple weeks ago, once we get to 10 Patreon supporters, I will be dropping a second episode that week, two episodes in one week. And I will be allowing the Patreon supporters to pick the episode by region. So if there's a particular region or a country you've been wanting to hear a story about, I would highly suggest you become a Patreon supporter so that you can go ahead and be a part of the process of selecting that bonus episode. So go do that today. You can also support the podcast by cash apping the podcast. The podcast cash app is dollar sign flourish foreign. And if you have a business or service that's in alignment with this podcast, you can actually place an ad on this podcast. If you're interested in doing so, head on over to the podcast website at www.flourishintheforeign.com and go to the contact page. Drop me a line and we can work something out. Of course, if you are listening to this podcast, it is so, so important to review and rate this podcast. If you are listening to this podcast for the fifth time or the first time, please take the time to review this podcast. It is so important. It is how people find the podcast. It helps with the organic search and also helps people to determine if they want to press play. People read the reviews. If you have not reviewed the podcast yet, please do that today on whichever platform that you listen to. Please go ahead and do that and be sure to give a five-star rating. Also, be sure to be following Flourish in the Foreign across all social media channels, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, all at Flourish Foreign. All right, that's it for the support portion of the show. On to the next story. Today's story, we have Tanisha of Girl Meets Glass. Tanisha went from being a professional techie in Washington, D.C. to a wine professional in Paris, France. Yes, quite the career change. Her story is fantastic, but I'm going to let her tell you all about it. My name is Tanisha Townsend. I am of legal age and I am currently living in Paris, France. Before I moved here, I was living in uh, the Washington, D.C. area. 
and I was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. I just always know that I was restless and always wanted to do something different, wanted to do something new, wanted to try something out, couldn't stay in the same place for very long. Like I didn't go to the same high school for four years. I mean, I made it through college, but that's because it was too much to try to leave college and do something else. But I always wanted to be somewhere else, see something else, do something else. And so I think that might have been early precursors of. And it's weird that I'm like that because it's not like my family moved around a lot or anything like that. I just wanted to. I'm like, my feet aren't roots. They're supposed to move. And so I thought I needed to be places, do things, go places. And that's what I did. I went to university at North Carolina A&T State University. Aggie Pride did not even know about study abroad. And that's something that I thought about later on. I'm like, man, I really wish I knew about study abroad then or that it was something that was pushed because I think that would have been a great thing for me to do for an internship or maybe a semester abroad or something like that. But that wasn't something I ever did. My major was computer science. After university, I moved to D.C., working for Lockheed Martin, and I was doing uh, computer programming. I started with computer programming and had a little apartment uh, just outside of D.C. in Alexandria, Virginia, and wrote programs and then realized, nope, don't like this. So I started testing. Testing was much better, trying to break things or figuring out how things could be broken. For whatever reason, I enjoyed that part and was able to excel at that. Grad school came about some years later. I used to watch American Justice on A&E, uh, cold case files, forensic files, and just really was into that kind of thing. If you're solving crimes, I'm trying to watch it. And uh, I came across a program for high technology crime investigation. And I was like, oh, this is perfect for me. Because my parents had told me you should go to grad school. And I saw this program for what was essentially computer forensics. I thought it was perfect. And I talked to my parents about it. And I'm like, I know you all think I'm flighty and doing all these different kind of things because they were very traditional. And, oh, so you're going to get an MBA, right? And I told them about this program and they were like, oh, that is perfect for you. And so once I got that cosign on it, I applied. When I first applied, I actually didn't get in. So I wrote a letter to the dean of the program and I said, listen. Undergrad grades, I can't do anything about those. So if that's what you grade me on, that's terrible. You're really missing out. But here's what I can offer you. My GRE scores were amazing. My essay was this. and just laid out the things that I have and could provide. So I got in. She's been accepted into a really cool grad program for computer forensics. And so I had to ask her, how did she get into wine from there? Grad school was stressful. I was working full time, crazy hours, and then doing this graduate program. So, I mean, I don't recommend this for other people, but I drank and I drank wine. But I did it like in a, a classy way because it was a tasting. So I went to a wine festival. It was called Wine in the Woods in Maryland was standing at the booth and tasted this wine and it was amazing to me. It was beyond just, oh, I'm tasting something or, oh, I'm just drinking just to be drinking. I had this wine and was like, this is good. How does it have these flavors? Like I'm tasting cherries and strawberries and all of this. And the guy was like, oh yeah, that's the fruit. And I was like, right, right. You grow this next to the, you know, grapes, you grow this on the vineyard. It's like, no, that's just the natural flavor. I was like, oh, so you crush in cherries into the wine while you're making it, and that's how you, and it was like, no, these are the natural flavors that just come. And when I tell you I could not understand or process this concept, I could not understand or process this concept. So I said, all right, let me go to the authority on this and figure out how this works. Well, Google clearly is where I went and did some Google searches and then figured out the how wine is made and the fermentation and the soil types and growing. We just got like kind of high overview. I said, well, I have to know more because that's just how it works. And that's what changed the whole thing. And I really wish I knew what wine that was, what stand, what booth, 
but who knew that it would change my life in this way? I enrolled in a WSET, which is the Wine and Spirits Education Trust of London. I enrolled in a course with them and you get a certification at the end of it. And so took that course, did well in it, met a gentleman after that who worked in wine marketing. And he said, oh, well, you should work with me. I'm like, oh, great. Let me add something else to my plate. So now we have full-time job, grad school, wine classes, and then wine marketing on the weekends. And from there, things just kind of took off in the wine direction. I finished grad school. I have that degree and then worked in it somewhat. But there was a moment where I realized that wine could actually be a career because I never looked at it as anything more than like a hobby, maybe like a side hustle kind of thing where I could pick up some extra change for new shoes, vacation, stuff like that. I didn't think of it as like, this is going to be a career. Because a lot of times when you think about wine and the wine industry and jobs, you think, okay, you're going to work in a retail location. Maybe you're an importer or you make wine or you're a sommelier at a restaurant. Like, it's not that many options. And I didn't want to do any of those things I just named. So I was given the opportunity from um, the, the wine marketing company I worked with. He was invited to a course in Burgundy in France and he couldn't go. And so he submitted my name along with a few others as someone who should go. They messaged me and I applied and I got accepted into the program. I go to the program and mind you, I'm taking the next level of the WSCT certification. My instructor was also in this program. He also got accepted. So I am there with him. And he was a master of wine. So like literally had the degree master of wine. We get there. He knows everybody because they've all been in the industry for a while. They're laughing, talking. We have to introduce ourselves. There were 12 of us. We have to introduce ourselves. People are introducing themselves. Hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm a master of sommelier. Yes, I'm a master of wine. Yes, I have my diploma of wine. I've been in the wine industry 20 years. I've been doing this for 12 years. They get to me. I'm like, hi, I'm Tanisha Townsend. And then I turn to look at the next person. No certifications, no letters behind my name. No, I've been in the industry this many years because at that point, I couldn't even really say I was in the industry. So I just didn't say anything. Was intimidated the whole week, but everybody was really nice. I listened a lot, took a bunch of notes, tasted wines that literally blew my mind. Then we came to the end and we had to take an exam. We were there, I think maybe six or seven days. And then we took the exam going all through Burgundy, each region we went through, walked through the vines, were in Cobbs tasting. Take the exam. I get to the first page and I'm like, oh, okay, no problem. I remember this. Get to the second page. I was like, whoa, I don't know this. Third page? Nope. Fourth page? Nope. And then we had a blind tasting. We had six or eight wines, maybe six. Blind tasting. And by blind tasting, I mean we had to write out our tasting notes. We didn't know what the wines were. Write out our tasting notes. Try to think of the year, the, the region where it was from. And I'm like, okay, let's do this. And they said, oh, and then you're going to be called to say your tasting notes out loud, but you don't know which one. I said, oh my God, what in the world? There were two that I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt what those wines were. So I wrote out my tasting notes really good for those two. And then they, they're going through. And then the first one, I'm like, oh, I know this one. Didn't call my name. But then the second one, they were like, and for this one, Tanisha Townsend. I was like, yes, I did my tasting note. And then I kind of looked at the uh, lady who was giving the exam. And then she kind of had a look of satisfaction on her face. Like, hmm, okay, good job. I mean, she didn't say that. That's what I took from her look. I passed the exam and got that certification. And from there, getting that certification, learning everything that I had learned in that week, being around those people that I was with, I was like, okay, this could actually be a thing. There are other careers in the wine industry and this is something that is uh, very serious and something that I'm actually good at and can do. And from there, my mind really changed for wine uh, as far as wine as a career. Still didn't quit the day job, but I became much more serious about my um, wine learning and wine activities after that. I asked Tanisha to describe to me her journey to Paris 
and how that opportunity presented itself. I spoke at a conference, a wine and tourism conference in Croatia. And then we had this trip after, they call it the fame trip, a familiarity trip. And we went through um, some wine regions there. And one of the women on the trip was a Black woman. So, you know, I was hyped because I'm like, I don't see us. Like back then, I didn't see us. Now we're around. We're much more prevalent. But then, nope. And she had been in the industry for a while. So we connected and um, then we kept in touch even after this. She sent me an email one day. It was just like, hey, I remember you saying that you love to live abroad. Because that's something that I would just throw out there when I would travel. Like, oh, wouldn't it be cool to live here? Because, I mean, a lot of times you do that when you travel. Like, I'd live here. This seems nice. Because vacation, everything is better and brighter on vacation. So, told her that. She sent me uh, this email. Mentioned you wanted to live abroad. Well, we're looking for someone to um, do classes for a semester at my school. Do you think you'd be interested? There'd be two classes. You create them from the ground up syllabus, teach the class, exams, all of that, and then also facilitate some tasting labs. You think you'd be interested? Oh, yeah, remember, I'm in Paris. So I messaged her back like, well, I could be in Paris next week or like tomorrow, like I'm ready. Of course, it didn't happen that fast, but she connected me with the director of the school. We talked back and forth, emails and a couple phone calls. And this was probably like maybe July where she sent me this email. Here's the thing. The opportunity to move to Paris came about at literally the perfect time. I had just gotten out of a very long-term relationship. We had just lost the contract that we were working on for a full-time job, so didn't have that job. I needed to move out of my place. And like everything was working in favor of a change. Like there was literally nothing holding me in DC at that time. I was going to need to move. Anyway, why not move to Paris? Like, since that was an option, since that's on the table, like, why not explore this option? Even if it's just for a little while, even if it's terrible, even if it doesn't work, why not do it? But looking back, I would not have moved. I would not have made this move, probably, if all of that hadn't been going the way it was. I didn't think the whole thing was real. This isn't something that happens to me. This is way too good to be true. No chance this is actually going to work out. Like this isn't even a real job. And that October, I was accepted into a program. So I used to do a lot with spirits and with bartenders and stuff as well. Went to Portland Cocktail Week. Full scholarship, one board taken care of. And through the people I met and the things that I did at that program, something just clicked. It was like, you're going to Paris. Start preparing yourself. And so as soon as I got back, I Skyped my parents and told them. My dad was like, okay, cool. Well, whatever you need to do, uh, you want to leave your place, come here. We got a home, so you got a home. And I was like, well, that's a great idea. So I actually packed up all my stuff. My dad would not let me drive alone. Mind you, I'm a fully grown adult. He flew to D.C. to get me and then uh, helped me pack the car. And then we drove back to Chicago. I was in Chicago for maybe a week and a half. Then first week of December, I got the message from the school saying, okay, we worked everything out. We can't wait to see you. This will be great. Classes start in February. This was December 2013. I came to Paris end of January 2014. I was curious to know what were the visa requirements Tanisha had to meet in order to teach in Paris? Here's what they were able to do. As an American, you can travel to European Union countries, so countries in the EU, on your passport for 90 days. I had already started an American company, and they were able to pay me through my American company. So that's why they only did a short contract, and they were able to pay me through that. And I didn't have to get a work visa for France, but I could only stay for 90 days. Luckily, the semester was, I mean, three months, so that's about right. I was right at 90 days. I asked Anisha to tell me how she prepared to move to Paris. And what was it like the day she left for Paris and the moment she landed in the city? It was crazy. I was filled with so many emotions. Like I was excited, then I was sad, then I was confused. Was never scared or fearful. That's one thing that when I look back, I'm like, yeah, you really weren't scared about that. I mean, I've later been scared about other things, but that wasn't it. 
And so I remember waving to my parents as I'm walking through, you know, the security line. My dad is somebody who's going to stay there and wait till I take my shoes off and put all my bags and stuff on the thing and then walk under the screening. He's there for the whole process. I turn on a wave because I know he's still there. I remember just thinking like, okay, you are really doing this. Like you have a ticket and you are in the airport. You are going to Paris. I knew not one person not a soul it's not like okay when you land you call this person you do this I mean I had an Airbnb for a week I said I'm gonna get an Airbnb for a week and that week I'll find somewhere to live it'll be great well all of that stuff did work out but I didn't know anybody I took the super shuttle from the airport to the apartment I had one suitcase and a backpack for 90 days I still don't understand how I made that work I take a suitcase and a backpack for weekend trips now but 90 days, I made work. And I'm in the super shuttle and I can't get crazy excited then, at least not visibly, because there are other people in the super shuttle. So they can't look at me like, wow, this girl clearly has never been anywhere in her life. And I've been to Paris several times before, but just the idea that I'm going to be here and stay here, that was like, whew, okay. Then I get to the apartment, I'm in the neighborhood. I was like, oh, wait. This is not the Paris I saw in the movies. This is not the Paris I've seen on trips here. I don't know where I am. I can't see the Eiffel Tower from here. Like, I can't see Paris. Things we think of when we think of Paris. So the girl that I went to rent a room from, super nice, very helpful. She gave me maps. She wrote out some good restaurants to go to, where to pick up a metro pass, all these different things. Stayed there for a week. And I found another room to rent from another lady and her daughter on the other side of town. And I stayed there for the rain of my time. And I call her my French mom. She helped me out with literally everything, translating documents, going to, taking me to the pharmacy and translating. Because another thing, I spoke no French. Bonjour, that bonsoir, merci. That's all you were getting out of me at that time. Maybe I could fumble through the numbers, but what do I need those for if I can't say anything else? Since I didn't know anybody, I was determined like, okay, how are you going to meet people? What are you going to do? So I joined meetup groups. So on meetup.com, they had all these different groups then. And I joined 52 Martinis, which I'm actually good friends with the owner of that group now to this day. So in that group, uh, American expats, black expats, still friends with a lot of those people that I met there. American expats, people come and go. And there were also a lot of French people in that group, which they're like, oh, we just want to practice our English. But first weekend I was in France, I met people, I met people from the American expats group and the Black expats group who are still my friends to this day, who have helped me out tremendously. I would not have survived here without them. Joining meetup groups and meeting people when you first get in, if you don't know anybody, is crucial. Nisha went to Paris to teach a wine course to university students. And I was so interested to understand more about what her classroom experience was like. I was so excited because I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm a, like, people are going to call me Professor Townsend. And I'm going to be standing up in front of full classrooms teaching. And I only needed to teach one day a week. So I had six other days to do whatever I wanted. So I took a language class for two of the other days because I had time. But the class, though, the students, oh, man, how can I say this? It wasn't at all what I thought it would be. In teaching wine, usually, and when I had taught before, because I was teaching wine courses when I was in Maryland, people are excited to take the class. They sign up for the class because they want to take it. Teaching French students is a whole different ball game. Most of them act like they don't want to be there. They don't want to pay attention. They needed to be disciplined. And I was not expecting that at the collegiate level. I think it was a hard sell for them to take classes from an American about wine in English, no matter how much they needed it. And so that part was difficult. Now, that was the kind of beginner year one class for, and that was about European wines. The other class that I taught, Luxury Wine and Spirits, they were much better. That class was much more interactive. They wanted to discuss. They wanted to have debates. They wanted to talk about American wine and how it wasn't good. They liked having these discussions. And so that class was a little easier. 
But there was a time where I used to get high anxiety and have heart palpitations. The class on Tuesday. So Tuesday mornings when I would wake up because I knew I would have to deal with these students. We were nine in the morning and, you know, they already had problems and arguing or talking to each other, cheating on exams. But the other days, the French classes were great. I took a class with a small class size. It was four of us in there. We sat around a table and that class was really good for me got me like a basis so I could just have somewhere to start. I mean, clearly I'm not about to actually speak, speak French after this time period, but it was a great start. It was one moment, and I think it was in like the final two weeks. I had just hung out with some friends. I was walking near Hotel de Ville, which to this day <clears throat> is still one of my favorite buildings in the city. And when I would have an expat moment, I would walk past the building and, whew, okay, I feel okay. This is part of Paris. The Hotel de Ville is like City Hall. And I was walking and then it was all lit up. There's a carousel on the front and then just the lights and just the buzz of the city. And I was like, I want to live here. This needs to be my life. I need to make this a thing. And I told one of the friends that, and she was like, okay, well, um, you're coming to the end of your time. Well, she'd asked me, she said, like, you come to the end of your time, what are you going to do? How's it going to go? Because she was here, um, she was American, here on a, a long-term work assignment. She's like, well, what are you going to do? And I was like, I want to come back. I want to do these things. And she was like, I actually believe you. She's like, I've heard this before. I believe you. When you come back, you can stay with me. Don't, you don't have to worry about trying to find somewhere to stay right away. If that is something that will hold you up from staying, you can just stay with me till you figure that out. But just come back. And I was like, okay, great. Once that worry was off the table, I'm like, wonderful, we can do this. And uh, yeah, at this point, I really didn't have anything necessarily tying me in the States still or anything that I had to necessarily go back to. So when I went back to the States, it was all about you find some kind of job doing something to make money so you can go back to Paris. And that's what I did. I went back to the States in May of 2014. I came back to Paris that October. So Tanisha finishes up teaching in Paris and returns to the States, but she decides she's not done with Paris. So I had to ask her, how did she prepare to return back to Paris for the long haul? Since I didn't want to get a new like career in America, when I came back, I was just like doing odd jobs. I would work wine tastings, I would do kind of like gig stuff. Like, oh, you need somebody to work as a vendor at a baseball game? Okay. You need a barista at Starbucks for two weeks for a conference? Okay. Those are things that I was doing, just little light stuff. So nothing tying me down. One thing I knew for sure was I was coming back to Paris. That was the plan. And then everything else would work itself out. And it is. I wanted to know what Tanisha's family thought of her going to Paris, coming back, and deciding to move to Paris for good. At this point, they were just like, okay, so what are you going to do? What is your job going to be? Do you think you can get a job? How do you think this will work? And uh, I was like, so listen, I have none of these answers. I literally don't know what to tell you, but I have this feeling that this is something that I need to do. And my dad was like, well, you seem to be feel really strongly about this. And my dad really, not, my dad knows me well. And so he can tell when something is a little flighty and I just have this idea or when there is something that I really need to go forward and pursue and want to pursue. And he sensed that about this. So he was like, all right, well, let us know how we can help. I mean, you can stay here clearly and then we just figure it out. My mom just looked at me like, oh gosh, we, we clearly went wrong somewhere with this one. We, we don't know what she's doing. But I think since I'd had success in my life previous and the rest of my life had been successful, I don't think they really hesitated or thought that there would be a problem with uh, this. I think they were just worried because I didn't have a plan. And that's something that if anybody moves abroad, I would say, don't, absolutely do not take my path. And I really didn't have a plan. My plan was just to move back and take French classes. Like that was it. And I'm like, oh yeah, and then I'm gonna do something with wine. What? Like that cannot be your plan, but it was my plan. And that's what I started with. And so I came back on a student visa because on a student visa, you can work part-time. 
And a student visa is one of the easiest ones to get. And I got a student visa to take French language classes. So came back, did language classes, worked teaching English. Again, had I had a plan, know what I wanted to do, I would have gotten a job in tech because since that's what I was working in before and they are always looking for American tech experts here, could have gotten a job doing that. But nope, taught English because I was burnt out on tech. And that's how I got back. I was curious to know how it was different or maybe the same for Tanisha upon her return to Paris. And what was it like her first year officially living in the city? Interesting. When I got back, all excitement, everybody was happy that I was back because people have been, I had kept in touch with people during that time and they were helping me through the visa process and all of that. So when I got back, hanging out, it was still like a vacation. Started teaching English because that was easy to get English teaching jobs. And then got in French classes and things were fine. I stayed with that friend I mentioned before. I moved in with her that October. I stayed with her till January. Then in January, I rented a room from another lady. Well, it turns out she was a lunatic, like crazy and shysty. So there's that. But unfortunately, during my first year, um, as I was starting to get a little traction to do some things, my mom passed. And so I had to go back to the States for a while and deal with that. When I came back, I did not have that same zeal, that same excitement, that same keep going, push forward. And it took me a while to get that motivation and that traction back. But when I came up on like the anniversary of year one, I was like, okay, Tanisha, you got to do better. This is not what your mom would want for you. Because the last thing she said to me was, I don't know what you're doing over there, but you seem really happy. I want you to keep doing what makes you happy. And then she handed me some money. And that always stuck out with me. And I reminded myself of that when I came up on my year anniversary in Paris. And I was like, this isn't what she wants for you. She said that she saw you happy and she noticed you were happy. You need to get back to that and make her proud. And so I kicked it into high gear. I had the idea for tours. And then I ran some for a couple of friends. And then the rest kind of went on from there. But the first year was a bit of a struggle because of that. But There were also some triumphs because all that happened. I had to leave that apartment that I was in, rent the room, and then was able to get my own apartment, a little tiny studio near Notre Dame in uh, Saint-Michel in the 5th. That place was tiny, but it was mine. I wasn't living with anyone else. I wasn't renting a room. I wasn't sleeping on the couch. It was perfect. I was starting to get my own sense of I guess, independence in being able to move around and feeling a little more comfortable and settled. And then um, the tour was able to start from there because there were also some really cool wine bars that weren't that far from there and was able to walk around that neighborhood, get my bearings and really start to explore local Paris and not just tourist Paris that I had previously known. Tanisha has a business, Girl Meets Glass, and I want to learn more about the origin story of Girl Meets Glass. It was very scotch taped, putting it together, okay? At first it was just, all right, let me do some tours for my friends and we're just gonna walk around and see how it goes. The idea came because when people found out what I was doing here, they were like, oh, I don't know about wine. Can you help me with wine? Can you go to the shop with me? Can you help me figure this out? Can you help me figure that out? I was like, all right, let's do it. And I'm like, well, other people might want this information. Let me kind of make this an official thing. And uh, I put the tours on uh, Viable and Viator. I got booked on Viable, went on the tour. It was horrible. First tour was horrible. The guy on the tour was mean. It was him and his wife. Mean. Had, he had feedback and a lot of it and had no problem telling me what he didn't like about it and what I needed to do different. I never got booked again on Viable ever. So whatever he said, he said it to somebody who knew something and never got booked on that service again. But yeah, I can't delete my tour off of there. So there, there we have it. But Viator, which is now part of uh, TripAdvisor, I get booked through them uh, often. And uh, that's how people will find me through word of mouth. And then my rating was good. So people will find me that way. But business is registered here under my name. I'm registered as an auto entrepreneur and I provide uh, 
furthering education for adults. And so this is why in education, that's how it's registered. I had someone help me with that process because again, this was early on and that level of French did not know it. Like legal, uh, foreign French, nope. So somebody help me with that. I have a professional liberal visa and that's a visa that you can get as an auto entrepreneur, which is just an entrepreneur. And that means you work freelance. I don't have the authority to get a work contract or work on a contract. Everything I did was freelance. And a lot of places are okay with that, with freelance, uh, with teaching, with tours, with tour guiding, all of that. Uh, most of it is freelance because it's easier on them. Because when you get a work contract here, you're on that contract forever. Like it's hard to break a contract for work if you have an indefinite contract. A lot of companies choose not to go that route and they can just pay people when they want or not pay them when they don't want. It gives me flexibility, but then I also lack stability. So you have to get a few of those to make things work. I also wanted to know how had Girl Meets Glass evolved over the years? Ooh, so much. One, my tours are so much better now. I have relationships with the vendors and the uh, places that I go to. And it is a much better experience when I'm in those places now. I have expanded it to day trips to Champagne and have a driver for those trips. So the driver picks us up at whatever Airbnb or hotel the guests are staying at. I also teach at universities here in Paris. I've gotten back into that. And I'm teaching at two different places, one for French students and one for American students studying abroad. Yeah, it has just evolved. I've gotten better at what I do. I've been able to make and build relationships. Started a, a wine podcast. I'm planning to do uh, and be more consistent with YouTube and doing YouTube videos. I'm working on a wine bar guide for Paris. So my business is evolving in that way. I'm now looking to move more into tourism outside of Paris into other wine countries within France and online learning, whether it's just virtual tastings or it is full online courses that people could sign up for and then the course works for them. And uh, even doing online classes as it relates to wine tourism. So doing it more regional instead of like, oh, well, this grape is Merlot and this is Cabernet Sauvignon. I want to do it regional. So this is the wine region of Languedoc. This is the wine region of Bordeaux and doing it that way. Tanisha also has a podcast called Wine School Dropout. And I asked her to describe why and how she started the podcast. I wanted to do a podcast for forever and uh, because I felt I had learned so much and have so much wine knowledge that I can't just keep it to myself. I can't just have it. I have to share it. I have to give it to the world. And uh, writing or blogging wasn't it. I tried video, but it's hard for me keeping as consistent with video because I don't always want to comb my hair. I don't always want to put on makeup. And you have to do that for video. With podcasts, you don't. Like, true confessions, I'm talking to you in pajamas. There we have it. So with the podcast, you can record that at any time, anywhere. Whenever I have a thought, it doesn't have to be super long. It can be short. And so that's why I wanted to do it. I was introduced to a podcast producer that lives in Paris. And then we had a conversation and she was like, oh yeah, would love to do a podcast with you. I'm starting my own podcast studio and would love to have a show with you on my network of a podcast. And that's how Wine School Dropout came to be. And her studio has completely blown up. Ochenta Studios is everywhere and Wine School Dropout is a part of that. Because there is much more to share. Gotten a bunch of questions and People have other things they want to learn about. Natural wine, organic wine is a big one uh, that I want to tackle in an episode. And boxed wine, I want to do that. Or just alternative package in general, wine in a can too. The name kind of just came to me. I was writing down a bunch of different things and I wanted the name to express that this wasn't a podcast for necessarily the wine professional, but they can still listen to it and hear like some fun anecdotes and things like that. It was for people who are really into wine 
or want to be in the wine, but don't know what they're doing at all. Can't pick it out in the shop. Don't know how to ask for it at a restaurant. Can't really articulate getting that good bottle or that good glass. I wanted it to be for them because there are a lot of them. Uh, they don't necessarily want to know about the soil and the sunlight and the amount of rainfall. They're like, all right, I'm standing in this wine shop. This aisle is full of wine. I literally don't know what to grab. I want to help them grab uh, the wine. And then I was sitting on the couch one day and wine school dropout popped in my head. Now, it might have to do partly with the Kanye and me being from Chicago and the college dropout thing. But wine school dropout popped in my head and I was like, oh, this is it. And then I started hearing wine school dropout. Like in the podcast, the word goes to wine school dropout. I'm like, yeah, this, this, I like this name. This is going to work. I had to ask the wine professional to give us wine advice. So here is Tanisha's advice to all of you thinking about learning more about wine or just being savvy consumers. It is an affordable luxury. It is a luxury that you can think of in an everyday sense or, and then maybe spend a little more to treat yourself. But you can get a good wine. If we're talking in America, I'd say you should probably be within the, the like 10 to $15 range. But in Europe, you could spend seven and it'd be amazing depending on what region you're talking about. Some regions you need to spend more just all the time. Like for Bordeaux or Burgundy in France, I got to spend more than that unless I'm buying it directly from the producer. Now, as far as wine advice, I would say, don't think you have to use these fancy wine words. You don't. Use fruits, use spices, use herbs and vegetables that you get out of the wine, but be able to articulate it. Like if you taste something, do you taste, like say it's a red wine, do you taste red fruit or black fruit? Is it uh, a currant or a plum? Or are you tasting cherries and strawberries? If it's white, are you tasting apple or are you tasting peach? Does it have like a perfumed aroma? When you think about it in that way and you think about the kind of things that you like, I like it when it tastes kind of tart like citrus, like, oh, I'm getting like some, some orange and maybe some grapefruit out of this. I like this. Say that when you are out shopping for wine. Also, if you are really trying to learn a little more about wine and get good bottles, you have to go to a wine shop. If you're shopping for wine in the grocery store, you already need to know what you're getting because you won't get the help you need in the grocery store. There's nothing wrong with shopping in the grocery store, but you're not getting assistance in the wine aisle at the grocery store. But if you are in a wine shop, and that person knows all their inventory, or that person has been trained, they can actually help you find what you are looking for. I asked Anisha to describe to me her experience as a Black American in Paris. It is much better being a Black American in Paris than being a Black American woman in America. Here, while there is racism, there are weird sentiments, I am American first. And I'm someone who I've been told I look American. And so I am very rarely mistaken for African, which Africans are not treated the same way here as African-Americans. And so I have not experienced a whole load of issues. The one thing I will say that I used to experience is being Black American and then also not knowing French. People were just intimidated to come up to me or to talk to me or to say things. So it was that kind of thing. I was different. And so they would stay in their group off to the side and then they wouldn't um, connect with me. But I was able to meet a few amazing people. And then, you know, it's always better when you get an introduction or a referral. So now that I had this cosign of this other person or this referral, I was able to get into spaces and sit at tables and move with the crowd that was able to help me, to teach me, to embrace me, and help me actually establish a career and a life. I asked Tanisha if there was a Black community in Paris, and also the relationship between Black expats and Black French people. It's funny because it's two communities. I would say Black French and then Black American or just Black expat in general. 
two different communities and they don't really cross too much. My black friends are American. It's hard to make French friends, period. But black French, they don't, or Africans, I'll say, they don't necessarily look at African Americans in the most positive light. And so having friendships with them is difficult. And that's if you're in the same places to even meet them. Maybe as I'm here longer and I move in different places, in different spaces, then that will change. But as my initial impression and my experience to date, unfortunately, has not been the best experience. Ask Tanisha, how is dating in Paris, the city of love? Girls trash. Girls trash everywhere. It's trash everywhere. But I think the thing here is people really, they look at Black women as exotic and Black American women. You don't know if this person is really talking to you because they're interested in you or saw something in you or if it's just like, oh, wow, Black woman, you American woman. Oh, wow. Let me just talk to her. Because I've had both. I had a guy, oh, I've never been with a Black American woman before. I'm so excited about this. I'm like, we're just texting. And this is like your third text to me. What? 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 Have used dating apps, have had success, have had failures, uh, have met people in real life. That's been fun. I've had much more success with meeting people in real life. I wanted to know what the Parisian hair care and skin care scene was like and whether Tanisha could get all the beauty products that she wanted. Oh, it absolutely does not compare to how it is in the States. Because in the States, in Chicago, I can just go to a beauty supply store and pick up everything I need. And it's at a decent price. Or I can just go to Walgreens and get a product. And then there's that. Here, yes, I can go places and find Carol's Daughter and Shea Moisture and products like that. The prices are not what I'm used to from the States. Because I guess we have to pay for the importing it and getting it over here. So there's that. Skincare. Skincare is fantastic. French beauty products are second to none. My whole system now is French beauty products and that's just what I go with and my skin has never felt better. Now the problem is finding somewhere to have your hair done for black service providers. It's like two and Paris is huge. Well, let's say two good ones. Paris is way too big for that to be the case and for there to be this many Black people here, American, African, French, whatever. I was talking with some friends the other day and we were talking about like just buying hair, whether it's weaving hair or braiding hair. And yeah, that's not as good here. There is usually someone always coming here. Like every month, someone is coming here or someone that I know from here has to go to the States. That has been the case forever until now. So I would order it and just send it to them, and then they would just bring it to me in their suitcase. Shipping something from the States, paying customs, and then maybe having it stopped by customs and then paying tax, oh my gosh, is the amounts are ridiculous. And sometimes you don't even get it. So that's a challenge. Something that I don't even mess with a lot. Like, I would love to get care packages. If people want to send those, great, I'll take them. But it can be hard if you're sending things like really of value. You want to send me a bunch of Reese's Pieces bags and boxes of microwave popcorn, I would gladly take it. But yeah, French customs, if you're sending larger things or things of value, that's a little harder. I asked Tanisha how her fashion has evolved by living in Paris. It has definitely changed and turned into more of a uniform, I'd say, making it easier for me to get dressed. I've also become more practical in what I wear since walking, taking public transportation a lot. Those, those shoes have gotten much, much flatter. My clothes are now much more comfortable. And I also have to think about warmth or being cool since I'm you know, on the train or having to do a lot of walking. Wear a lot more black than I ever wore before. Wardrobe used to be full of colors. Now it's full of black so I can get dressed quick. Multiple things go with multiple things. And that's what I mean by uniform. Instead of having like, oh, this one fancy piece can only go with this one shirt, can only go with these pants. This is a set. No. Also, I have less room. I don't have a, you don't have space for a big walk-in closet. Like, that's just not how it works here. You buy an armoire or you have a a rack and you put hangers on there and you have a few clothes and that's it. 
here's the thing about Paris. Paris can be whatever you want it to be. If you think that it is that stylish, you will always see stylish people. If you think everybody has beautiful skin and looks amazing, that is what you will see. But if you think that everybody it wears the same thing and has the same style, then you will see that. Now, I think there is a formula for Parisian style, but some people go outside the box. Uh, Fashion week is always interesting because you get to see people doing some really different and um, kind of exciting things. And that's always nice. Right now, it's it's messy hair, it's a little eyeliner. It's the makeup, no makeup look, natural skin. A trench coat is always Parisian. That striped shirt is real. They actually wear that. Casual jeans, boyfriend style, rolled up at the ankle. Ankle always has to be exposed. Stan Smith Adidas, or maybe like some ankle boots for women, a whole lot of black, either a crossbody or a tote bag for the purse, either no lipstick or a red lip. I also asked Tanisha about her experience trying to secure an apartment in Paris. For an expat, for a freelancer, oh my gosh, you gotta move like heaven and earth. It's hard. I moved a few months ago. And it was really hard for me to find a place. I sent out nothing less than 50 requests to view places or emails. And when people found out I didn't have a work contract, they wouldn't message me back. Someone who has a work contract, which you can see how much they earn, and they earn that every month. And a lot of times people are in couples. So you have two work contracts. That's always going to look better than my one freelance contract. So I ended up having to get a guarantor and I used a service online that would guarantee my rent for a certain period of time and up to a certain dollar amount. So putting that with the rest of my application, that's what made the couple here that I'm renting from. That's what made them think, okay, we'll take her. And they said they didn't have a problem with me being freelance. And I'm like, oh, good, because so many people do. A lot of people will say like, oh, if we get a freelancer, we're, we don't look at the paperwork at all. And we don't respond back. We don't email them back. Nothing. I asked Tanisha how how French politics affect her day-to-day life and how American politics still affect her while living in Paris. Oh, absolutely. And it affects my view on how things are done in America, how things could be done better in both places. I mean, the It also helps me understand why the French are the way they are, and why they kind of act the way they act sometimes with certain things. I will say the French government is like, the French will complain about high taxes all the time. But then I look at it, I'm like, the French government, how they have helped people throughout confinement and with what their stimulus packages look like, what the healthcare package looks like, how many benefits you get. Yeah, taxes literally hit me over the head. But when I think about all of the benefits, I'm like, how are y'all complaining? Like y'all have five weeks of vacation and then a whole bunch of holidays. I think about all the benefits that are here versus the benefits that are in uh, the States. With the main one, and I think everyone who lives outside of America says this, but healthcare in America is terrible. How much you have to pay for it and the quality of care you get. And that's not the case here. The pension boycotts and the uh, rail strikes, that was more of an annoyance for me and frustration. The yellow vest, tourism took a dive from that. And since I work in tourism, tourism definitely um, took a nosedive during that time. People weren't really stopping coming here because of the train strikes. But with the yellow vest, people canceled trips, people canceled tours, people said they weren't coming or they didn't want to go certain places. And so having to, and then you also couldn't go certain places because they'd be shut down. So trying to get around was impossible. You could cross over certain parts of the city because they shut down the metro stations. Then they shut down the streets so you couldn't take the bus. One of my good friends got married during that time. She had to take the metro in her wedding dress because she couldn't get a taxi because the taxi couldn't drive through one of the uh, protests. We started a little late, but it's fine. She got married. She was beautiful. But we were all like, the metro and your dress? I think the way it affects me now living here is 
mainly how I think about things, just growing up in the culture of American politics and then also in Chicago politics and Illinois politics, which is also crazy. Just how I think about politics in general, it has framed that. And then I'm also able to see how things are done better and how they should be done and maybe how there could possibly be a different balance. I also think that being here, I get to see American politics in a different way because it is presented different. No one here has a stake in it. And so I think I get to see things that aren't as filtered or as driven to the left or the right information that I get here. I asked Tanisha where she saw herself in the foreseeable future. I see myself here for a while. America right now, especially looking at it from a distance, America is crazy. I'll go visit my family, but I'm good here and I want to stay. And I, I mean, like, I can kind of speak French now. Like, I got to use it. And I made some connections. I got a nice apartment in a nice neighborhood. I'm good. I asked Tanisha to describe to me her concept of wellness and how her wellness practice has evolved by living in Paris. I don't think I necessarily had a good sense of wellness before. I think wellness was like, all right, every now and then I go to the spa with some friends and hang out at the spa and do that kind of thing. I think that was my idea of wellness. But now seeing just how the French live, they really relax. I mean, sometimes I'm like, okay, we need a balance between the way they do and the way Americans do it. Americans work too hard and the French work too little. Y'all need to come in the middle and meet up. But now my sense of wellness, of really taking time off, of really stopping things and resting, taking care of myself, whether it's doing facials, whether it's just not working, whether it's taking a walk, getting a decent amount of sleep, sitting at a cafe and just having a coffee and watching the world go by. I also asked her some general advice for all of you thinking about moving abroad. Oh, be excited. It is an amazing experience. It is absolutely amazing. And anyone who's like, oh, should I do it? Think about who you are as a person. How are you in relation to instability, to change, to not quite knowing what could happen next or how to get something done? How resourceful are you? These are skills and things that you need to have in order to live abroad. How comfortable are you being uncomfortable? Are you going to be perfectly okay going outside the comfort zone or not quite knowing how something works or how something should be done? How will you feel about that? Those are all things that you have to um, think about and consider when uh, living abroad. But again, advice, if you think you can handle it, just know it won't be easy. But it is an amazing experience if you're open for it and just really honest with yourself about if you can deal with it. It's amazing. And pick a good place where you can meet people. That was such a great story. Thank you so much, Tanisha. And if you are interested in keeping up with Tanisha, you can by following her on her social media channels. You can find me everywhere. I am Girl Meets Glass on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. My website is girlmeetsglass.com and uh, the podcast Wine School Dropout, iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. All right. Thank you so much, Tanisha, for sharing your story. And thank you all for listening. I really appreciate it. And thank you to Zachary Higgs, who produced the music for this podcast. If you're interested in getting music for your podcast, your YouTube channel, or your next project, definitely hit up Zach. He is phenomenal. And I'll leave all of his information in the show notes below. As always, continue to support the podcast either via Patreon or Cash App. Be sure to subscribe, rate, review and share the podcast that's it for this week thank you so much for listening and as always please take care of yourself wellness is not a fluffy concept it is definitely a necessity all the time but especially in these strange times take time to rest 
take time to refuel. All right, that's it. See you next time. Bye. On the next episode of Flourish in the Foreign. At that point, I refused to look for another job. I no longer want to work for these companies or corporate America where I feel like I have to constantly climb up this ladder and being kicked down. I realized how expendable I was to them and I no longer wanted to feel like that again. I realized I wasn't a worker bee. I was a boss and I needed to boss up.